Uh, I'm going to be uh, echoing some of Michael Kumhoff's points. Is Michael in the audience or is... Can't see him. Hey, mate, good to see you. Uh, with a different perspective because Michael pointed out that for the conventional economics, and that includes the economics that's practiced by the European Central Bank, unfortunately, uh, ignores the role of private debt completely. And we both say that it's absolutely vital to include it. And just to be mentioning Paul Krugman, this is a, not a quote from my, my so-called debate with Paul, but uh, out of his book, pretty much saying when debt is rising, it's not the economy as a whole borrowing more money. So in other words, he sees no relationship between the level of private debt and the level of money in the economy. And it's basically impatient people borrowing from patient people. So what I've done in my, I take a different approach to modeling using what's called system dynamics. And I took the model that Krugman and his co-author published where they had the bank acting as an intermediary between a consumer goods producing agent and an investment goods producing agent. And the consumer goods, the bank, the bank profiting out of this by charging a fee. That was their model. And I put it together in my software package I call Minsky, which is open source, freely downloadable. I'd love to have more people playing with and seeing how it runs. But it, basically I can show assets and liabilities and equity, which is the, the fundamental concepts you have to have to model a monetary system. And what I have here is the consumer goods sector, which is this agent here, lending money to the investment goods sector, repayment going, of course, back to the other one. Interest, the reason the consumer sector makes the loan is for the interest payment. The reason the bank introduces the two is to earn a fee. So that's the model that the mainstream has. And all the transactions, the financial transactions, are between non-banks. The banks don't really play any active role. That's the fantasy model they live in. It's the only way I can describe it. It's a fantasy, it's not the real world. And fortunately, uh, the central banks, including the Bundesbank, have come out and said that just recently. So when you look at it, where's the debt in that model? It's not an asset of the banking sector. So it has to be an asset of the consumer goods sector. That's how it's shown in my system. So I have the off the balance sheets of the banks because the banks don't own the debt in that model. They're just an int introduction agency. The debt is an asset of the consumer sector and the lending and repayments operations occur down here. When it lends money, the consumer sector lends money, it necessarily has its bank deposit fall. When it's repaid, it necessarily rises. Now you put that together and model it, and I do in my software package Minsky, which I'll bring up now. Okay. Then if I show, I'll just bring up another, if I, I'll stick, stick just with that one for for simplicity. Notice here I've got a graph of the level of GDP and the level of debt. And when I simulate this, you can see I've got a rising level of debt to GDP that's showing up down here, but it's also showing up on the, on the right hand side of this axis and the left hand side shows GDP. Now you can see a rising level of GDP, or of debt, pardon me, no change in the level of GDP. And down here, I've got the debt and the money stock. The money stock is constant. Change in debt is not changing the amount of money, which is precisely what their model assumes. And if I increase the rate of lending and slow down how fast repayment occurs, then the debt ratio rises dramatically, but nothing happens to GDP. You can ignore private debt if you're managing the macroeconomy in this universe, which is not, unfortunately, the one we live in. Uh, now I'll then see, speed up how fast repayment occurs, slow down lending, you can see a massive plunge in the level of debt to GDP, and not much happening in the real economy. In fact, for a short while, GDP actually rises. That's the world they think, they, they think we live in. Now I'm gonna go back to exactly the same initial conditions I started with, and I'm going to change it to be the real world we actually live in. So I can go inside Minsky and say, Let's just organise this a bit more sensibly. It's not true that the debt is an asset of the consumer sector. Yes, there's some peer-to-peer -peer lending, but it's fundamentally bank lending that drives the economy. So I'm going to delete that as an asset of the banking sector, and I'm going to delete the fictional financial transactions between the, um, between the uh, two non-bank agents. And then I'm going to go across to the banking sector's model, banking sector's accounts. And I'm going to show that, in fact, the debt, which is still stowing in the system because the debt's a liability of the investment sector, that is actually an asset of the banking sector. 
So Minsky brings across those operations. I now show the interest payments are made to the bank and get rid of the silly bank fee thing. Yes, banks charge fees, but the fundamental source of income they have is from charging interest on debt. And now when I simulate this model, those are all the changes I've made. You've seen me make them. Okay? There's no magician going on here. Notice that debt and GDP are now both rising. The increase in debt is causing a change in the money supply. If I speed up how fast lending occurs and slow down repayment, the growth rate leaps and so does GDP and so does the debt level. And then if at a later point, if repayment speeds up and lending slows down, we have a financial crisis. That's the world we actually live in. But unfortunately, the vast majority of economists, Michael is about the only exception in the neoclassical world that actually models banks properly. And you saw the difference in his model. Now, I've shown the difference in my dynamic systems approach. We're right, the rest of them are wrong. And they're managing the economy, which is why we had a financial crisis. And we need to get away from their way of thinking because as well-meaning as they are, and they're all extremely sincere people, but one year, one of my teachers once, having a, we're having a class debate, and we're all debating about a particular politician, and we're all attacking him, and somebody said, well, at least he's sincere. And we all agreed, yes, he was sincere. There's no doubt about that. And the teacher popped up from the back of the room and said, don't overrate sincerity. The most dangerous person you'll meet in your life is the person sincerely chasing you down the road with an axe trying to chop your head off. In other words, if they're modelling the world the wrong way, they're doing everything completely sincerely and screwing up the real world. And that's what they're doing. And Michael and I are both trying to end that. So they're ignoring this whole process of the creation of money by the banking sector and ignoring the impact that has on the real world as well. I'm going to jump past these slides because I've just shown you that same effect live. I don't need to repeat the slides. But what is actually fundamentally going on is that demand and income are both driven by the turnover of two things. The turnover of existing money plus new money and new demand from credit. And that's what's left out of the conventional thinking. They leave out the role of credit because in their model, credit changes who spends. It doesn't change the aggregate level of spending. In the real world, it does. And what you can explain by using credit, looking at the, the data which they collect themselves but ignore, we can explain everything that happened in the financial crisis and where we are today. Now again, for the reasons of time, I can't show you all the information I'd like to show you, but this is, looking, this is a graph of the level of private debt in America, which is the red line, graphed on the left-hand side of the chart, and the unemployment rate on the right-hand side. Now looking at that, Superficially looking at that, one might say there's no relationship. And that is indeed what's one of the colleagues of uh, one of the Nobel Prize winners, Edward Prescott, a colleague of his called Ahanian, looked at precisely that relationship and said, there's no role, we can ignore it. He didn't even realise, and I hate to say this, but it's true, he didn't even realise he was not looking at credit. Though the label said credit on the graph he was looking at, he was looking at debt. Credit is, debt is the amount of money you owe. Credit is the change in the amount of money you owe per year. And he dismissed this on the basis that credit didn't change all that much without noticing that what he was talking about, if it was actually credit, was the increase in debt every year, doubling, doubling the level of debt every year, which is insane. It's simply the numbers should alone have told him he didn't know what he was talking about. This is the relationship when you look at the change in debt. I think the relationship is obvious, don't you? Now, the same thing applies in asset markets. That is the relationship of household debt to house prices for America. Some relationship for a while, then it seems to break down, and then you've got rising house prices with falling debt. No relationship. This is the Amer Australian data, biggest housing bubble in the world. Okay. This is Japan going in the opposite direction. Now, I can easily make sense of all three by saying what actually drives the change in asset prices, and this is why the ECB should be focusing upon asset prices as well as consumer prices, is that what drives change in asset prices is change in mortgage credit. And it's quite a simple thing to start from intellectually. If you I mean, they take a flow, it's a supply, they talk in supply and demand all the time without understanding either. But let's take a supply and demand analysis. Let's say that the, we're looking at the flow of demand per year 
of housing and the supply of housing per year, two flows. I'll leave aside the supply because, again, of time, but the flow of demand is fundamentally new mortgages divided by the price level. If you imagine the number of standard houses that can be purchased, it's divide the new mortgages per year by the current price level. That gives you fundamentally the demand in units of housing. Differentiate that with respect to time, you get a relationship between the change in new mortgage credit and the change in house prices. And that makes sense of all those three. This is now the relationship between the change in household credit and the change in house prices in America. Correlation coefficient is 0 0.71 over 30 years, and we've done the range of causality on that, and massively says that causation runs from credit to house prices, not vice versa. So the ECB, all the central banks, should be focusing upon asset prices and preventing asset price inflation that is driven by lending. That's the Australian data, 0.6 over that 30-year period. 50 years' worth of Japanese data, pretty much, 0.4. The data's overwhelming. The causal relationship is being ignored because the mental framework that our economic managers have, called neoclassical economics, leaves out the dynamics and leaves out the role of money and debt. Now, the one person in, in the whole profession who does that properly is Michael from the neoclassical point of view. But we need a new way of thinking about the economy. We're not going to get it from the mainstream. So I'm one of those working to produce an alternative approach where money, credit and debt play an essential role. Now, I know I've got very short time period for this discussion, so I'm going to finish pretty rapidly there and take questions. I'm happy to talk about the cause of financial crises as well, but given our time constraints this morning, I think I'll stop on those points about asset prices. Sure. Any questions? Martha Kruger from the University of Aschaffenburg. I'm, I'm very intrigued by your presentation, also by Michael's, and, and what strikes me especially is that if you took a monetary economist from before World War II, yeah. a lot of what you're saying probably would not surprise him. That's true. And I wonder how, how has it come about that uh, mainstream got so far away from what was part conventional wisdom, what, you, what you're explaining now. That's very true. In fact, for example, if you, you'd know that, that Pigou was the person that Keynes regarded as the classic, the, 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 the archetypal classical economist he was attacking. Well, in 1927, Pigou published a book called Industrial Fluctuations, and as part of that, he showed graphs just like the ones I've showed here. So he understood it. So did Fisher after making the mistakes before the Great Depression. So it's an American disease that began in the 1950s, and I think it was Alvin Hansen, no, not Hansen, pardon me, it's, um, huh? Gurley and Shaw, but also before them, the one that uh, Krugman eulogizes all the time of, huh? Tobin, Tobin, came along with what the new model, and the new model simply said, banks are just another form of intermediary. And this nonsense about them being intermediaries has been cemented into the minds of American neoclassical economists, and they dominate the global profession, unfortunately. If we could go back to the earlier wisdom, we might get somewhere. But it also involves learning what Fisher learnt the hard way, and that is you cannot model capitalism in equilibrium. It is an out-of-equilibrium system, and that's not a bad thing. Okay? Being out of equilibrium is rather... For example, none of you could walk if you tried to maintain equilibrium. Okay? Because maintaining equilibrium means each step you took, you, your centre of gravity is still between your feet. You try that, you'd take 20 minutes to make it to the doorway. Walking is a disequilibrium process. So the, 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 the fetish that economists have for modelling everything as if it's in equilibrium is simply a fallacy. And that's partly why I think they've stuck with the loanable funds, because that is an equilibrium model, as you saw. Change debt dramatically, nothing happens to the GDP. But it's wrong and it's dangerously wrong and we're paying the price for it now. So, my name is Simon Dietz. Uh, I have a question to you and to Mr. Kumhoff. Um, do you think that, uh, that mainstream is uh, modeling the world like it should be? Mm. And in order to work properly, the rules of the game uh, has to be changed 
by introducing full money system. Would, uh, so, uh, if we introduced, uh, if we changed uh, the rules of the game and introduced the full mm. money regime, then probably the mainstream would more or less uh, would, would more or less uh, model uh, the world correctly. <laughs> That's true. The question is, would it work? And my problem is that I think that we, banking, if you think about banking as an industry, banking has two means by which it makes a profit, price and quantity. Now, the price is the margin between deposit rates and loan rates. Okay. The quantity is the volume that they produce of credit. Now, if you go to a system where they are just making money on the margin, banking would have to fall by a factor of 10 or 15, I think, in terms of its size. And would it be profitable? Most of the time, I think the answer would be no. Venture capitalists, uh, normally, very, very, only a tiny fraction of them make money. If we try to make banking across to where it's an intermediary, there would normally be as many failures or more failures in loans than there are successes. And they certainly couldn't maintain the scale of operation they've got. I don't think they should. I think they should fall dramatically. But there are serious technical and sustainability issues in going across to a 100% money, government being the only money creation system. I, I would be in favour of that if you included, for example, everybody having money given to them by the government that they would then give in crowdfunding for innovators because the most difficult thing in capitalism is getting money into the hands of people who innovate new ideas. And frequently that is something where they will lose money in the first instance. You don't know that Tesla is going to be the successful electric car manufacturer, but you know you need electric cars. So you have to find a way of getting, the, getting that money creation to the people who need it. The current system doesn't do it. I don't think enough attention has been paid by the 100% money groups about how to make up for that as well, just out of government money creation. And I certainly would not leave it in the hand of bureaucrats alone. <laughs> um, um, Stephen, I have a different take on that last one, obviously. Because uh, um, I think it's uh, the money creation under that system that you raised would um, should I use that instead? Okay. Yeah. Um, would be done by government, but money allocation would be done by the private sector, and um, I, I have no reason to think that efficient financial markets uh, wouldn't allocate uh, the money properly. So I, I, I think this is to me this is not an argument against um, for reserve banking. But Steve and I have long disagreed on that one. But the, coming back to your original question. Uh, if we had a system of full reserve banking, wouldn't then the mainstream models be right? No, they would still not be right because they don't understand what money is. Yeah. <laughs> right? They because still think we live in a barter economy. Because yeah. it would still be a barter economy. There mm. would still be intermediating goods. It's not, it would not be understood that what these financial institutions would be intermediating is purchasing power. The banks themselves have nothing to do with the allocation of goods. They have something to do with the allocation of purchasing power over goods, and it's the private sector that then allocates that purchasing power to goods. That is not present in the models uh, that we now have, and if we had a full reserve banking system, it would still not be right. Well put. Okay. Thank you. Um, hang on. My name is uh, Carl Clausen. I'm uh, from the Swedish, uh, from the Riksbank, the Swedish Central Bank. Uh -huh. um, two questions. One uh, more technical, which I, I didn't get. What kind? Of, what was behind the simulation? What kind of model you had? Okay. If you could just, it's half a minute, if it's possible, to say what what kind of, and uh, then. Uh, the, uh, another question is, and that is also for Kumhoff, what would be the implication for how we implement monetary policy under an inflation targeting regime if we should take uh, properly into account what you're saying? Good questions. Um, Minsky is uh, part of a family of software packages called system dynamics programs. They've been around for about 50 years. 
If you got here in a vehicle made in the last 10, it was designed using those systems. That's any vehicle whatsoever. Uh, so system dynamics is extremely common in engineering. So I'm using engineering mathematics and engineering software. And you can see what's actually shown there are differential equations. Uh, that's, this is the extremely simple model uh, of the loanable funds model. It's not a particularly complicated model. But what's going on here is that each of these tables is generating a system of differential equations where the entries in each row are the flows. So this column, the rate of change of debt is lending minus repayment. That's a differential equation. And then I'm simulating that using what are called time constants, which are variable in the program. So you can see the impact of changing them as time goes on. You can build extremely complex models this way, uh, which are based on financial and physical flows. And the biggest model that's been built so far is a model of the Portuguese economy by one of my PhD students, which is more accurate out of, simula out of sample simulation than either the central bank or the treasury's model of the Portuguese economy. And that was done by a master's student. Okay. So I would love to talk about this in more detail. It's very relatively easy to do once you have the right technology basis for it. And because Minsky, Minsky adds to this software package, this family of packages, uh, of programs, the capacity to model using double entry bookkeeping, whereas all the other programs use flowcharts. So you can see what's going down here are a set of flowchart definitions to define what the debt ratio is. Okay. So the, these wires are linking mathematical operators uh, in a flowchart format. But we'll have a talk over coffee, if you like, later on that front. And then on the other question, um, I'll let Michael take, take the first stage and I'll come back after him. Yeah, I, I was just going to uh, answer the question about monetary policy implementation, but I think what this highlights is something that we have also recognised at the Bank of England, is that we shouldn't be so closed-minded about what models we use. And so mm. we are actually really trying uh, to be open-minded about that, for example, we're looking quite a bit at agent-based models uh, where the academic profession, again, is quite sceptical. Because um, I think, you know, what you just said about the Portuguese economy, better forecasting performance, that should ring an alarm bell and say, shouldn't we be looking at this? Shouldn't we be looking at this, perhaps, uh, and compare it to what we're doing? Um, and do it with an open mind, I think. Uh, and I, th I don't think this is that hard to, to learn. Uh, uh, so that, that's that, and th th then on your specific question of monetary policy implementation, no difference. The model, and when it comes to monetary policy implementation, and, uh, is, is essentially, it's not, a, uh, it, it's not a different model from what we have today, but the transmission of monetary policy shocks uh, or the tra the, uh, is different. Uh, in that model, the magnitudes are different. The way monetary policy shocks translate to the balance sheet of the banks and the way balance sheets of banks translate to the real economy is different. So the quantitative differences are there uh, and, and quantitative differences matter. But it's not like there's something that, 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 that forces us to completely toss away our existing models. In fact, in the very simplest case, um, which is the case in the paper that I presented, you only need to change one equation in the model and leave everything else the same. The monetary policy reaction function is the same, the fiscal policy reaction function is the same, everything except this one change to the budget constraints uh, that I was talking about. Yeah, mine is slightly more general than, again, it was, took one change of equation for me to go from loanable funds to endogenous money or bank-created money. So that's similar in terms of the structural ease of doing this. The main thing I would focus on is do not let private get, debt get too large because what we're actually living in right now is the biggest private debt in the history of humanity, not just capitalism, history of humanity. I'm showing you America's private debt to GDP ratio there. That's only from the last uh, 50 years, but you can see it's the highest level of private debt in the post-war period. When you normalise for pre the much poor, more poorly recorded data back in the pre-war period, it is the biggest in the history of American capitalism. So I've let ourselves walk into the biggest debt trap ever because we didn't realise the debt was actually a trap. You can see the credit dynamics there that I've got for the credit rate and notice that the level of credit in America never turned negative except during the financial crisis. And it turning negative is what caused the financial crisis and the fact that it got so big 
was why the, 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 change, in, the change in credit was so dramatically important. The same thing applies if you take a look, oh, pardon me, wrong control arrow, Japan, that was the canary in the coal mine. We should have learned from Japan 25 years ago, 30 years ago, we didn't. Because again, we continued ignoring the role of private debt. You can see the same story. Its economy has gone through a debt bubble and a slump. Credit went from 30% of GDP to minus 15%. That's why it's been in a slump for that length of time. The same story applies if I take a look at, oh, actually, Greece, this is, this is Greece. I'm just taking a few countries as a sample here. And China. And China managed to get through the financial crisis by turning on the private debt bubble. Now, we have to realise that, A, we've let it happen, and B, we've got far too much debt in, this, in the global economy, and we have to write it off. So a major policy I would have is an intelligent process of debt jubilees to eliminate the level of private debt, get it back to sustainable levels, without benefiting people who speculated over those who did not. Uh, it's more a comment than a question. My name is Frank Engelmann from University of Stuttgart. Well, I think your point was whether... Uh, there should be a different reaction function, monetary reaction function, perhaps. Whether the existing monetary reaction function that you used for reasons of comparison, whether this is still somehow optimal, yeah? Or whether mm. yeah. there might be an implication with respect to policy. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I would be going for the policy function is quite inadequate by focusing just upon interest rates, and I argued this 25 years ago before the crisis struck back in Australia. Yes, you wanted to elaborate your question. Yeah, uh, I, I, it's of course an important point yeah. when you do this kind of exercise, uh, but. Uh, Maybe my question was also, I, it was a, a nice answer, so, uh, but uh, I was also thinking about quant things like quantitative easing, more unconventional policy. Yeah, yeah. Because there seems to be the idea that we can control the amount of money in the economy and then that would matter, or, but that yeah. is somewhat at the odds with what you're... Yeah, I, quantitative easing has, has had a trickle into the real economy but it's fundamentally driven up asset prices. If you look at the reason Bernanke argued in favour of it, it was that asset prices increases would cause a wealth effect, the wealth effect would cause more consumption, etc., etc. There has been a dribble of money that way, but I think for every trillion dollars poured into the American economy by, by quantitative easing, maybe 100, 100 billion turned up in the actual economy in terms of turnover. Effect. So it did have an impact, but it's massively increased inequality because the people who have benefited out of actual quantitative easing have been those who own shares. And fundamentally, that's not me, and it's not Michael, it's, it's Rupert Murdoch and it's his friends who've made money out of that. So we've amplified the inequality that occurred during the bubble itself. So we could do quantitative easing for the people, which is what I call a modern debt jubilee, and that would uh, correct the mistakes we've made in the past but we also have to, in the future, keep an eye on the level of private debt because once it gets past about 80% of GDP, from what I've told and looking globally, uh, then you start to get credit dynamics dominating the economy, and those credit dynamics, particularly if they cause asset price inflation, lead to financial crises. Um, I think quantitative easing does fit into the framework. Um, if you take into account, and I think you've mentioned that, that um, quantitative easing in our current monetary system can only issue reserves, right? Not, well, I mean, it could in principle issue cash, but it basically can only issue reserves. So essentially, reserves can only sit on the balance sheet of agents who can hold reserves, and that's banks. Mm. Uh, and therefore, uh, on the liability side, they will one for one lead to an increase in bank deposits. So quantitative easing one for one leads to an increase in bank deposits, and that is the objective because there may not have been enough purchasing power in the economy, not enough liquidity, and this created some liquidity. But the agent who determines what the aggregate amount of bank deposits is, is still the banking system. If the banking system says, okay, so now my bank deposits have gone up, but I don't really like it, I'm going to lend less, it can easily offset this, right? So you have some control, but you have another agent that also has a lot of control to work the other way if he or she feels like it. So it does fit into the framework. Hmm. 
Given the time, I would suggest that we head on if there are no very, very dramatic and... Is there one very important question left? So, um, There's one over here, the yeah. same. So then the last question, please. Thank you. Okay. My name is still Christoph Pfluger, and um, I wonder whether the debts in the world actually can be repaid. There are something like 8 trillion M0, central bank money. We mm. have something like 30 uh, trillion uh, bank deposits, and we have 230 trillion in debt. Mm. And uh, I couldn't figure out how we can ever, ever um, you're right. We so can't. we're actually in a, in a condition of bankruptcy, and yep. I, come, I come from Switzerland. And if you if you're facing bankruptcy, you have to deposit your your books. You know, your, mm. that's the end of it. Mm. The, Michael Hudson put it best. Another good friend of ours. And Michael said, "The debts that can't be repaid won't be repaid." I've added, all you've got to work at is how you're going to not repay them. And you want to not repay them in the least damaging way for the economy you have at the moment. And that's why I think the only way out of this is a, is a debt write-off on a grand scale. Uh, now, we, that was also the truth for the Second World, for the, the, uh, the Great Depression. And the way we wrote the debts off was, the, was we called it the Second World War. But if you look at what happened during that period, the scale of government spending was so dramatically high. In one year, the budget deficit in the UK was 40% of GDP. Now, nobody objected to that in the House of Commons because they objected in the House of Commons, not that I mind the language, but they would have been speaking German a year later. They didn't want to do that. So nobody said, let's not spend that money. The scale of government spending was so enormous that the private sector's debts were basically paid down because A, there was so much money being generated for the war effort, and B, spending was rationed. The only thing you could do with your money was pay your debt levels down. So the way we got out of the Great Depression was the Second World War. Now, I don't need to tell anybody here we can't afford a Third World War. But we have to have a red debt write-off that gets rid of the debt overhang we have, and that has to be done by writing the debts down. There's no other alternative. Thank you.